Welcome to day in review number two of 2015. Uh, let's go over what we talked about in class really quickly. Today we talked about naming acids. Now acids are molecules that release hydrogen ions in solution. So as soon as we say an acid is a molecule, you need to remember that molecular substances are also covalent. So we know that if it's covalent, we're looking for two nonmetals versus something that's ionic, which is a metal and a nonmetal. So there are molecules that release hydrogen ions in solution, and they have easily recognizable formulas. What we're going to look for in an acid is we're going to look for hydrogen in the first position. So hydrogen can be bound to anybody in group 17. So it could be hydrogen with chlorine. It could be hydrogen with bromine, hydrogen with iodine, hydrogen with fluorine, any of those. And we know it's an acid because we're looking for the hydrogen in the first position. And uh, we have two types. The first type I showed you was binary. So binary, remember that word bi means two. So a binary acid is one that has hydrogen and something else. Uh, oxy acid would be hydrogen and a polyatomic ion. So we have two types of acids that we we'll have to slow down and look at, and there's two different ways of naming those. So uh, I said here that they're referred to as acids only if they're dissolved in water. We'll talk more about that later when we get into acids and bases. So binary have two atoms, bi is two. One of them has to be hydrogen, and that hydrogen has to be in the first position. And we name them like this. Hydro, so we're going to name the hydrogen hydro. Then we're going to take the nonmetal, which is probably going to be a halogen. We'll just take the root part of that nonmetal, and we're going to change the ending to ick, and we'll add the word acid. So here's our example. This is an acid because hydrogen's in the first position. I know it's binary because there's only two things there, hydrogen and something else. I'm going to name it, name the hydrogen hydro. The root of this, which is bromine, I'm going to change it to brom ick and call it acid. So that's hydrobromic acid. Here's the next one. This is also a binary acid. Again, I know it's acid because hydrogen's in the first position. I know it's binary because there's only two elements there, hydrogen and chlorine. So I'm going to name it using this method, hydro, the root here is chlorine, so hydrochloric acid. Same thing with this one. This is hydroiodic acid because it's hydrogen and iodine. Now, naming the oxy acids, you've got to have your polyatomic ion sheet out for this one. If you've lost your polyatomic ion sheet, go over to the chemistry locker. Look for a folder that says printable reference materials or printable tables. I'm not quite sure what it's titled. And open that up, and you'll find a polyatomic ion sheet in there. So oxy acids are acids that contain a polyatomic ion, and the polyatomic ion we're using will have oxygen in it. So it's called oxy anion. So remember, if it's an anion, it has a negative charge. We said cations were ions with a positive charge because the T was a positive. And we could think of anions as A negative ion. So a negative ion is an anion. Those are the negative charged ones. So the oxy anions are polyatomic ions. So we're going to look at the name of the oxy anion. If it ends in 8, like sulfate, carbonate, um, arsenate, we're going to change the ending to ick, and then we're going to add the word acid. So uh, I gave you as an example H2SO4. We know that this is an acid because hydrogen's in the first position. I know it's not binary because I, after the hydrogen I see sulfur and oxygen, so I know I can't call it hydro something. I'm going to have to ignore the hydrogen and just look up the polyatomic ion. When I do on my polyatomic ion sheet, I see that SO4 is sulfate. We said if it ends in 8, we're going to change the ending to ick and add the word acid to the end. So this is sulfuric acid. 
as soon as you hear the word acid in a in a uh, name too, you'll know if it's binary or if it's uh, uh, oxy acid because if we say hydrosulfic acid or hydrochloric acid, then you know it's binary because we said hydro. If you just hear sulfuric or um, chloric, then you know it's got to be an oxy acid. If the polyatomic ion ends in ite, we're going to change the end to us and add the word acid. So here we have H2SO3. I know it's an acid because hydrogen's in the first position. I know it's not binary because there's two things following it, a sulfur and an oxygen. So I'm going to ignore the hydrogen and I'm going to pick up my polyatomic ion sheet and I'm going to look for SO3. When I find it, I see it's sulfite and I said if it ends in ite, we're going to change the ending to OUS and add the word acid. So H2SO3 is sulfurous acid. I gave you a little way to help remember it, and it had to do with this little doggy. And this little doggy ate so much, he felt ick. So that helps you remember that if it ends in eight, we change it to ick. I ate so much, I felt ick. Then after he took some Pepto-Bismol, now he's all right, ite. He's no longer nauseous. So ite goes to us. Eight, ick, ite, us. So far, so good? I had asked you to, in your homework on the left-hand side, so this would be on page 3, to write these 10 acids down and to name them as part of your homework. We'll go over those tomorrow. Then we started on page 6 in our notebooks with the metallic bonding lecture. Um, metallic bonds uh, explain the properties of metals in terms of their ductility, malleability, conductivity, um, shine. Uh, all those things can be explained by the metallic bond. Uh, when metal atoms get together, they have a tendency to overlap their outermost energy levels. So remember when we talked about metals in general, we said metals had large atomic radii and they had few valence electrons and that outermost energy level that were very, very loosely held. So the outermost energy levels of a metal is, is almost empty. So if we look at a collection of atoms, uh, for example, let's look at maybe sodium, and we know that sodium has on its outermost energy level one electron. So that level is almost empty. So if we have a collection of sodium atoms, they'll be able to get close together and those outermost energy levels will have a tendency to overlap. So we've seen this overlapping thing kind of like in a covalent bond which allows you to share electrons. Well in this case this overlapping allows the electrons of one element or one metal to uh, travel from place to place. So this electron once it gets uh, in a group of metal atoms no longer is stuck to its atom. Now it can go and hop on another energy level and visit one atom or another atom. It can stay with its own or it can go to all of them. So that those electrons from each atom are constantly moving. And so we say they're delocalized. So the valence electrons travels from one metal to the other and it's called delocalized, which is a word I want you to know. So delocalized electrons mean that they no longer have to stay with their atom anymore they're going to be able to travel through that group of atoms. So we, we describe elect, the uh, metallic bonding by using something called the electron C model. And the electron C model shows these metal atoms with their delocalized electrons. So remember, when you're an atom, you have a, a, a neutral charge. It means if we've got uh, hydrogen here, uh, well, let's do sodium. Sodium with its... Um, it's uh, 11 electrons, one on the outside. Once that electron gets removed, you can't call it an atom anymore. It's going to be called an ion. So with these delocalized electrons, now that they're able to move from place to place throughout the sample, those atoms now turn into ions. So when we look at a metallic bond, what we're looking at is the positive metal ion being attracted to and held together by all these delocalized electrons from all the other ions around it. 
So metals can be thought of as metal ions because the electrons are now moving away, surrounding by a, surrounded by a sea of electrons. So that negative electron force attracts uh, the metal, uh, positive metal ion. Positive metal ion attracts the negative electrons, and that's what that um, metallic bond is. It's that uh, attractive force between the positive metal ion and the delocalized electrons. And that's what holds it together in that nice crystal lattice. So the more valence electrons you have as a metal, the stronger that's going to make you. So if this metal, each one had only one valence electron, it wouldn't be that strong. But if we, if we had a metal that had three valence electrons, that would mean we'd have three times as many electrons holding those metal ions together. That would make that metal sample much, much stronger. So let's see how conductivity, malleability, and shine can be uh, explained by the metallic bonding. So we know that in order for conductivity or for conduction to happen, you have to have two things in place. One of them is you need to have charged particles, and those charged particles have to be able to move. If they can't move, then you don't have conduction. So we'll say movement. So I gave you as an example when we talked about crystal lattice before, uh, we looked at a crystal lattice of sodium chloride as an ionic solid. And we said that um, with sodium chloride, we have positive uh, sodium ions surrounded in, on all six sides by negative chloride ions. And each of those negative chloride ions was in turn surrounded on all six sides by these positive sodium ions. So we have tons and tons of charged particles. The problem is, is those charged particles are locked in position by their opposite charges, and they can't move. So uh, an ionic solid has the potential to conduct, but not as a solid, because it has to be able to move. When we compare that to a metallic solid, and we said the metallic solid consists of positive metal ions surrounded on all sides by these delocalized electrons. Now, since these delocalized electrons are delocalized, that means they have uh, the ability to move. So if they can move, they can conduct in the solid state. So let's look at what these two things have in common. What do they both have in common? They both have charged particles. Now, let's look at the charged particles that they have in common. Each one of these has in common a positive charged particle, that's a cation. So there's cations in the ionic and there's cations in the metallic. Now let's look at the negative charged particle. On an ionic solid, the negative particle is an anion. On a metallic solid, the, the negative particle is an electron. So that's where they differ. The positive ions are the same, they're both cations. The negative particles are different. There's an anion on the ionic and there's an uh, electron on the metallic. That's going to make a big difference too when we talk about the ability of these, these substances to conduct. Metallic substances can conduct in their solid state because these electrons are able to move from place to place. Ionic solids cannot conduct in their solid state because these, all these charged particles are locked in position and they cannot move. So when the delocalized electrons move, when you put a source of charge uh, next to them, that's called electricity. Those delocalized electrons can also interact with light and cause the metals to shine. That's where we get the reflection. Uh, light tries to pass through the sample, strikes a delocalized electron, and becomes reflected back. That's why you can't see through a metal, but you can see through an ionic solid. The electrons in the ionic solid are locked into position. They can't move, so light can pass through them. When pounded, the metal uh, atoms can rearrange themselves, and the electrons will adjust into the orbitals of their new positions. Ionic solids can't do that. So let's look again at a, a crystal lattice of an ionic solid versus the crystal lattice of a, of a metallic solid. Remember, with the ionic solid, we said that all the 
uh, like charges, or all the charges were separated by um, opposite charges. So we have positive, negative, positive, negative all the way through. With the metallic substance, we have our positive charges are surrounded by and separated from each other by those negative delocalized electrons. So let's imagine here that we're going to take a uh, microscopic hammer because this is, this is very, very small when we're looking at ions here. And we take a hammer and we strike this area of the ionic solids. This one's ionic. So when I strike this and force it down, what's going to happen is I'm going to change the position of these ions. So let's move this guy. Let's say we hit it and we change the position by uh, one, one uh, ion. So now we move this down here. So that means when we change the position, we now have positive ions next to each other, negative ions next to each other. And like charges repel, and when you change the position and cause them to be next to each other, you're going to cause them to spring apart from each other, and that will cause this to break once you hit it. So these guys are, um, are uh, brittle because they will break versus this metal sample. Versus this metal sample. If we strike this metal sample and we shove these um, ions down one row, we're going to find that we still end up with uh, the charges being separated from each other by those delocalized electrons. The electrons will travel along with it. So with a metal, no matter how many times you strike it with a hammer, the delocalized electrons are going to move along with those positive ions and always have them uh, separating each other. So you'll never have like charges next to each other. So you can get a um, piece of metal like down to one or two atoms uh, thick, very, very, very thin, uh, and they'll um, uh, not, not crush. Okay, for homework, I'd ask you to, uh, on page three, you're going to do, um, you're going to do, let's see, oh, you're going to read page 250, and um, I want you to do on page uh, three, opposite your uh, lecture, of, we're going to do 23 through 29. And I, well, I'm asking you to do that worksheet I gave you in class that has the naming, the uh, uh, formulas uh, and the um, covalent, uh, the acids, naming the acids. I also asked you to bring uh, two new pennies. So something from the year 2000 uh, plus works the best. If you don't bring pennies, that's okay. Um, but uh, if you want to take your pennies home after we uh, change them, uh, make sure you bring two because it's kind of interesting. And that's about it. So hope this helped you out.